A, finish cheese everyone. That A sweet that finish cheese set the cut you want. I just want to say good morning. Thank you to you for attending. Welcome to the fourth annual Power of Purpose. My name is Sage Blacksboro Logan. I grew up in Bremerton, Washington, and I'm attending school at UAS to learn more about my Clinket heritage and to connect with my Clinket heritage. I'm the main reason to coming to UAS was to learn the Clinket language for me and to hear the, the voice of my ancestors in the beautiful Clinket language. Words cannot express how grateful I am to be attending school here. I'll be your MC for the day, introducing each of our keynote speakers and giving the event welcome. We are also thankful that you are here. And in a moment, I will review the day's, today's schedule, cover some participant expectations, and let you know about new additions to this year's symposium. I'd like to start by first welcoming Dache Slach, or Colleen James, to the stage. She is our Student Equity and Multicultural Services Manager, who will introduce our first speakers of the day, representatives from Aquan. So let's give a round of applause for Colleen. Okay. Yuck A Sutat. Good morning. And we're streaming too. Is this are we streaming out this morning? Is that what I'm understanding or not yet? Later today? We're streaming. Okay, very good. And uh, hello to everybody out in in internet land. Okay. So Gunalchish to our lovely student Sage. Uh, my Clinket name is Dach Kish Uch. Uh, it comes from the head of the Nass River. I am Tantaquan. I come from the Ketchikan area and Metlakatla. I am Clinket Haida and Simshian. Um, I recently learned that my father's people um, not only include the Kaguan Tan, the Eagle Wolf people, uh, Simshian, uh, Irish, but additionally, English, so I've got more research to do to understand how that that has entered into our family lineage. So I'm excited. Um, my my grandfather's people are also the um, Simshian, uh, the Irish, the English, the Haida, the Neich Adi, and then our outer shell are the Tequedi. So Gunalchish to the Brown Bear people here. Gunalchish. Um, I appreciate that our culture, the Klinkit culture, the Haida, the Simshian, um, part, of, part of our understanding how we're related to each other is to understand our ancestors and our lineage, um, which instead of being strangers in the room, we're all related somehow. So I'm honored to be amongst all of you. And I have, <coughs> excuse me, I have the honor of bringing up some really fantastic people. Um, but before I do that, I wanna just acknowledge whose land we're on. Um, our campus, as well as the, um, the Ketchikan and the Sitka campuses, they all reside on Clinkett territory. And um, so honored that here, we are specifically on Ak Kwan territory. And for folks who are new to this, um, new to hearing me speak or, or new to our campus this semester, um, Ak is small lake and Kwan is people of. So Ak Kwan, people of the small lake. And, and their territory is more than just this campus. Um, and, and I'll stop talking about that, but it's a be beautiful territory. And we are right next to the Taku Kwan people. And so if you folks have um, the opportunity to go hiking or skiing or fishing or berry picking, um, be mindful of whose land you're on. Uh, they've been fantastic stewards since time immemorial. And uh, we're all honored to be here on their land. So uh, my first speaker that I would like to invite up is Frances Houston. Uh, she is Yachde Tan. She's a raven dog salmon lady. Um, she recently started with her, her clan, uh, with her actually with the Kwan. They started the Ak Kwan Cultural Land Conservation back in 2017. That's pretty phenomenal. They are advocating around the clock 
for um, sacred sites and protecting our land. So um, they were, we were conservationists, I think, long before that term came about. Uh, we call it stewards of the land. And um, she is also the tribal spokesperson and we're honored that she's able to join us. She's been a part of some really beautiful changes in our community. Uh, most recently is the Willoughby District name change. It now reflects the Auk Village District, so that's beautiful. What an acknowledgement to the people from this area. Uh, and then also we were just visiting, and I won't go into too much depth, but um, we, we're living in some really cool times. We, we were just acknowledging how cool um, over the last couple of decades that the Juno community has really stepped up with the names of schools. So Zonta Kahini, the middle school, and that um, we have a lovely person who is part of our, our campus. She's our vice chancellor, um, Rinalda Cadiente Brown. She was part of that naming of the middle school, Zonta Kahini. Um, and then we also have our alternative high school's name, Yakuski Dakahiri. That's also a Clinkett um, title. And then most recently with JD High and the students advocating for it, uh, the Yada Atle. I, I hope I said that right. Um, but I just, I wanted to acknowledge that. Those are all part of uh, what Fran has been a part of. Um, and what some of our other wonderful uh, leaders here at our campus have been a part of. So uh, you're witnessing some pretty cool things. Um, and now I'd like to invite Fran up. Good morning. I think they all need coffee. <laughs> Good morning. There we go. That's my favorite saying for the day. Uh, I, uh, that's the best time of the day for me because I'm a morning person. So uh, I would like to say thank you very much for uh, inviting me to come and speak for this power and privilege symposium. Uh, I'm always grateful that I get to come here. Didn't sunshine this time though, but anyway, it's liquid sunshine. That's the way we look at it. So I am honored to be here and do the welcome to the Aquan territory. And as Colleen had mentioned, it's a large territory. It's from Berners Bay down to the end of Seymour Canal, Douglas, the tip of uh, Admiralty Island, north end of Admiralty Island, uh, up to Berners Bay. And I'm sure that most of you have gone out to the Oak Rec area, and everybody seems to enjoy that place. I don't blame them for enjoying that place. I go out there, I guess, just to look at how pretty it is out there, how peaceful it is. And that's where I find peace. And if I feel like talking to my ancestors, I do. And I usually get an answer when I talk to them. And I thank them. There's been a lot of improvements out at Oak Rec too. We're not done yet, but most of it is done. Very, very pleased as to what the Forest Service has, has done and those around that participated in making it even more prettier to be out there. Um, I think the only thing that I insisted on was the speed humps. That had to be done. They said they can't. I said, no, it has to be done. And I won my little argument there. And it's safer now to have the six 
speed humps there. I thought three. So I'm very, very pleased with that. Being as selected as tribal spokesperson, my mother, Rosa Miller, she was our tribal leader, but she's 93 years old now and she has stepped down. So she gave me the honors. I was scared to have that title as tribal spokesperson, but you know what? She had faith in me and accomplished a lot within the last three years moving forward. The things that she couldn't do anymore made a difference. And all I can do and, and say is I stand tall for the Akwans. I do what is necessary to voice my opinion. Um, I'm one of those that I get a little bit antsy when they're talking and I want to butt in, you know, but the, I have to be polite and wait until they're done. And then, then I can voice my opinion. Then it kind of leans a little bit more in what I'm suggesting. So, uh, don't have a college degree, but I have common sense. And I rely on my common sense. That's my best friend. Then I get to see my cousin here. I think the last time I saw her was last year, but it's like it was yesterday. So she, she's our opposite, and uh, it's always good to see her. It's good to even be here at UAS, family, friends, and family again. That's what UAS is all about. Everything that's happening here, wonderful. Everything that's happening, other, other than, you know, teaching the Tlingit language, understanding the ways of life, it's also happening to the younger generation. To me, that is the greatest thing that anybody can do for our children. Great opportunity for them to learn the Tlingit language. Opportunity to learn how to harvest foods. Show the love. Keep them away from what may come their way. And I think all that is offered out there is stirring all the children in the right direction. That makes me happy. Because growing up here in Juneau was difficult. But I like seeing what I see now on what's being done. There's a future in my great grandchildren learning how to speak Lincoln language. I just know a few words. Uh, hooch, no more. A few other words, kunafchish. Just little basics, but I never had that opportunity. And then seeing my great grandchildren dance, toddlers, they were born to do that. It's in their blood. And hearing my great grandson say a sentence brought a tear to my eye. He said it in Tlingit. And I said, honey, what did you say? And he says, I love you, Grandma. I lost it. I totally lost it. And I says, I love you too, dear. And what can I do but give him a big hug? So he taught me a sentence. But if I would try to remember it now, it's, uh, I wish I had it here to be able to speak the Tlingit language. I tried, but I just don't have it in the back of my, my throat. But with the Tlingit culture, any other culture out there, it is beautiful that you're able to share and able to teach.
and show the love to one another. That is the direction that it should be going and not deal with the negative, only deal with the positive. That is my way of thinking. I love the positive. Good things happen. I didn't mention my Tlingit name, which is Sekuni. What it means in English, we have no idea because that's one of the names. Sekuni is one of the names that is very, very old. I even asked elders what it meant. And they couldn't tell me because this is a very, very old name, centuries old. But I'm proud to have the Tlingit name of Sekuni. My father, Chukanadi, from Huna. My grandma, great grandmother, which was his grandmother, she fascinated me when the first time I ever met her. She was only eight years, I was only eight years old when I first met her. And she never spoke English. She spoke Thinket. I had no idea what she was saying. But you know, I looked at her face, I looked at her hands, and what I felt that was coming from her is that she loved her great-granddaughter. That's what I got out of it. And uh, she totally fascinated me. My grandmother, Bessie, she's quite a fascinating woman. She was all about the Atoll. Powerful little lady. We loved her to pieces. We would go bear picking, we'd go fishing, this kind of stuff. And all the time we thought we were having fun, we were working. <laughs> and and uh, if we went berry picking, where's all your berries? I, I spilled it. You got blueberries all over your face. And I think it was one thing that she loved with all her grandchildren. Very powerful little lady. So I'm not going to take much more of your time. I just thought I'd run a little bit by you. And for today, on this Power and Privilege Symposium, just want to wish each and every one of you to have a wonderful and beautiful day, even though it's got the liquid sunshine out there. So enjoy. Gonna cheese for allowing me to speak. Gonna cheese. So I have um, some jam that was made this summer from our family. So I just want to say gonna cheese for joining us for this really amazing event. Um, thank you. Wow, okay. So Fran mentioned uh, balance, and it wouldn't be appropriate for us to only invite a raven speaker. Um, balance, if you're familiar with the Clinket um, cultural values, we have two clans. We have the raven and the eagle, which we call our opposites. I'm a raven and I'm married to an eagle. I'm married to my opposite. Um, and, and we have a lovely eagle lady here, eagle shark wolf lady. She's Wushkitan. The next person I'm going to invite is Le Momi. Um, Le Momi, she is incredible. My husband and I met her through um, some community free courses, and Leomomi is a kumu in our community, and I'm really honored. Um, if you don't know what a kumu is, um, from the Hawaiians, they have the, the leaders, the disciplinarians, the culture bearers, and um, Leomomi is that. And my husband and I learned, we tried our best to move our bodies, uh, 
in the way of hula. And she's so gracious and, and so kind. Um, she even allowed us to dance with her um, after a few, uh, I think it was like two months of classes. And um, my husband's a lot smoother in moving across the floor. I've got a lot of work to do. Um, I think what's so beautiful about this, uh, this gathering here, uh, the Power and Privilege Symposium, is that it invites you to bring your whole self forward. And um, I appreciate Lemomi in that she acknowledges her Tlingit and her Hawaiian ancestors. Um, she is part of uh, the Daughters of Hawaii. And that's a nonprofit organization that charges all of um, the women to embrace the Hawaiian knowledge, the language, the protocols, ceremony, um, along with the storytelling that goes with hula. Her family comes from, if I butcher this, Nihihau. That's the birthplace of her family. Uh, her local organization is called the Halau Hula Oli'i Li'i Ula. She's the Kumu. And so if you ever wanted to learn Hula, look for this lovely lady. Um, she is so wonderful. She's been a part of our community and a part of the Hawaiian community and so generous with all of her, uh, what she's learned and um, always welcoming people to learn from her and with her. So on that, I would like to invite Lemomi Le Kumu um, forward, our Wushkitan lady. Good morning. Aloha Nihoa. My name is Lea Momi uh, Martin. I grew up in a very matriarchal um, families of both Hawaiian and Clinket. My first introductory of the Hawaiian culture was through my grandmother back on Oahu, Olokai. I never learned English, probably when I was about 10 years old. The school, the education, was from Kamehameha School, where um, all the subjects were taught in Hawaiian. So that was the privilege that I had coming from that culture. Then, um, my grandmother uh, was the main boss lady of our household, where she taught us the arts, the crafts, the language, the dances, everything that she had grown up with through the island of Nihau. Nihau is kind of a, uh, has its own dialect compared to the rest of the Hawaiian Islands. So it has that little extra um, dialect that, um, that we have used in my upbringing and training. And so when I went to Kamehameha School for the first time when I was probably about five, six years old, and I carried that dialect into my classroom, and I was kind of surprised that none of my uh, classmates sort of, kind of, understood what I was talking about. But then when um, my teachers realized who, who I was, where I came from, so that brought into uh, something that was really wonderful and very accepting. So from that was the love that I have for my Hawaiian culture. And 
coming from there was to Alaska. My mother is half Japanese, half Tlingit. She was married to my father, who was from the Hawaiian Islands. And so I had the chance to get to know both worlds. And coming to Alaska at a very young age, we came in the wintertime. And I didn't realize how dark, dank, wet, no beaches. And I was too, I was really disappointed. And I spoke to my mother in Hawaii and says, where are the beaches? Where's the volleyball court? And my mother and my dad looked at me really funny and says, you're in Alaska now. So when I first met my grandmother, Helen Green Salped, Wishkitan uh, Akwan, her clinking name is Dao Du'u, my mother, Mary Ann Sakamoto Matunding, has three clinket names. Class A is the one that I know real well, and I can't remember the other two offhand. So these ladies were the instrument of my upbringing. I first met my clinket grandmother, and it was very special, it was different. It was something that I really, um, had to think about this, trying to figure out, okay, I'm in Alaska, I'm in a totally different realm, and I have to figure out how I'm gonna do this as a kid growing up. Because um, for my generation, we were kind of in between um, the aftermath of World War II, everything that had affected our family was because of what happened in World War II. My grandmother lost her husband um, because he was Japanese. He was sent to an internment camp and his relocation was in Hunts, Idaho, Mini Dakota, where he stayed and finished, um, uh, stayed there and so that, that, so that whole um, um, atmosphere really took on a totally different meaning compared to the Hawaiian Islands. And so I was faced with a crisis in our family. And, and I felt um, that I had an obligation. And that was to learn the culture of the Klinka people. So my grandmother um, would always put us in our, in our living room then she was the storyteller, a Dao Du'u, meaning storyteller, told us who we were, where we came from, how we originated. She brought in more people from our family. And that's where I met um, Aunt Bessie Visaya. These two ladies are powerhouses. Uh, when they travel throughout Southeast Alaska to Cake, um, I had the opportunity to travel with my mother and with these two ladies, and I saw the respect that these two wonderful ladies had. And another gentleman that I was very honored was a gentleman from Ketchikan, Forrest DeWitt Sr. He, my grandmother, and Aunt Bessie, all sat in our living room telling us who we were. Never forget who you are. And so their storytelling wasn't 15 minutes, half an hour. You're, you sit there for two days nonstop. As kids growing up, um, we went through that. And ever since then, I finally, for the years of going through this training with our elders, you had people from Cake, Moses Rose, Alice Dukakwa, all these people that um, had such a powerful effect on my, on my person uh, as a person. And I finally understood who my grandmother was. 
and I had so much awe and respect for her. So there, I was really totally involved in the Klinka culture, learning how to dance, how to sing the songs, uh, how to take a joke when it came at you. But because of both cultures, I was able to walk in the middle. And because I didn't come from a strict um, non-white um, background, because of my background is, is I'm kind of like the mutt, as you might want to call her, high in 57, because not only that I am part Hawaiian and Klinka, but I'm also Filipino and Spanish. And somewhere in there, in my genealogy, is a little bit of German. And so it's just interesting to have all those open air classrooms, visiting these people that were still alive. These were my tutors. And these were the people that taught us who we were. So from there, I was able to understand who I was. And I'm still figuring that uh, who I am and how I can become a better human being by being, teaching, being an example, a role model. And one of the, the trainings, especially on the Hawaiian culture, is um, teaching hula, the modern, the ancient, and the ancient is, is hard. Because I had to know every vowel if you've ever been to Oahu, if you see the road signs, that's not the half of it. And so learning both culture is, is a lifelong university, and it still is. And so I really thank the UAS for inviting me to the Power and Privilege Symposium, to Colleen. And I want to say goodness cheese, aloha mahalo, nui loa. And I want to end as a chanter in my Hawaiian culture. It is called the Ole Kahea Nuhi Nun. And this is from my auntie, uh, Edith, that had taught all of us this chant. And it means in English, God, raise up our knowledge, bring us closer to our knowledge, and learn the knowledge. Eho mai, eho mai kikilani uye, o na mea o huna, no ia o na mele e. Eho mai, eho mai. E ho umai, e ali e, mahalo. So this is some jam that we put up this summer and we just want to say ganachish, mahalo nui loa. Um, if, could I invite all of you to give another round of applause to our wonderful Aquan ladies? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's my. That's the end of my time here. I'd like to invite Sage back up. Kenneth for lending us your ears. You folks are all appreciated. Okay, goodness, Chish, Lemomi, and Francis for all your contributions to the UAS Power and Privilege Symposium. As I mentioned earlier, this is the fourth annual Power and Privilege Symposium at the UAS Juneau campus. This event is designed to give members of the UAS campus and Southeast Alaska communities the opportunity to explore dynamic and pressing social changes through difficult, thoughtful, and honest conversations about the complex and increasingly diverse society in which we live. As a couple of housekeeping items to keep in mind as you move throughout the event today, all gendered restrooms are on the second level of the Eden uh, Library, right across from the help desk. And near, sorry. I can't, 
trying to think of where the bathroom is. You think I would know? <laughs> so they were saying that I'm not supposed to tell you guys about this bathroom. You know, that's only for the faculty. But uh, if you need a restroom, gendered restrooms are in the Egan Wing on the second and lower floor. Spice Cafe is going to be open throughout the day for coffee and tea purchases. And any further questions you might have can be directed to our check-in volunteers. And another thing I wanted to mention with the check-in volunteers, they have these amazing t-shirts this year. All your check-in volunteers will be wearing this t-shirt. And the Klingit phrase on here is Kusa Khan Tin Yagach Tudlak. And it means we will succeed with the love of people. So that's Kusa Khan. Tin, yagach, tudlak. Gonna sheesh. Okay, if you have a copy of the symposium, please grab, please grab it now. If you do not have a physical program and would like to tag along, you can view the program PD in PDF form on the UAS Power and Privilege Symposium website. Our schedule today is structured with two keynote sessions, a number of breakout options and an end-of-day banquet designed to continue the conversation. Here in a few minutes, we'll be having the opening keynote, Forrest Wagner, present Climate Despair and a Psychology of Hope. After that keynote, you will have multiple options to choose from during each breakout session. Both the titles and locations of those sessions are on pages four and five of the program. If you want to know, about, know more about individual sessions, there is a more detailed schedule later in the program booklet. After two breakout sessions, UAS Dining Services will be providing a free lunch at noon in the Lakeside Grill. Right across the courtyard, this is the Morant Building. That's where the, the lunch will be. That's also where dinner will be. At 1 p.m., Heather Kendall Miller, former senior staff attorney with the Native American Rights Fund, will kick off the afternoon with our second keynote. You will then have three more breakout sessions prior to dinner. We are doing something new for dinner this year. We're hosting a banquet-style dinner where some of your presenters and your table hosts are your table hosts, which will be provided by UAS Dining Services again at five and again at the Lakeside Grill. You'll notice at the bottom of page five that there is a section titled Other Rooms at the symposium. There are several opportunities that I'd like to point out to you. First, we have a pop-up art show today in Egan 224, put together by Juno School District Alaska Native Design Class. Make sure to check out our local high school students' work. You should be aware of our safe harbor room located in Egan 220. It is a place to go if you're having a challenging time or just need a place to reflect. Counselors from JAMI will be on hand to provide support. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I have one more page in the program for you to reference the glossary of terms on page 23. I encourage you to read the terms. They are common words you'll be hearing throughout the day and understanding the shared definition will be helpful. Our, our first keynote of the day is a faculty member here at UAS, Forrest Wagner. Assistant Professor of Outdoor Studies and Arts and Sciences. In this keynote address, Forrest will talk about the climate, climate despair and a psychology of hope. Please join me in welcoming Forrest Wagner to the podium. Thanks, everyone. Just a moment to get set up here.
Good morning, everyone. And thanks to Sekouni, uh, Francis, I agree with, with her that positivity matters. Um, and with Le Mami that Anchorage uh, and Fairbanks and Juneau as these urban centers are in fact cold and dank and dark, but they're also Alaska in general is this contrast of cold and dark, but also of light. So this is my talk, Climate Despair and a Psychology of Hope. Thanks all for being here. Why am I here? It's uncomfortable to accept power dynamics as decision makers in our lives, in the opportunities we receive, how consequences are doled out. I hesitated accepting this speaking invitation because of my race, gender, and class. My colleague and mentor, Ernestine Hayes, always recommended speaking when asked. So this is for Ernestine. This is also for Richard Nelson, who many of you know died last week. The Island Within is a very important book in my life. In fact, when I first moved to Southeast Alaska at the age of 20, it was The Island Within and the Book of the Tongass that convinced me to make that trip from my hometown of Fairbanks. One of those classic Richard Nelson quotes, and I heard this improbably in an interview uh, through the radio feature on my old iPod at the high camp on Denali through an Anchorage public radio channel, when something like, and this was after his work with, work with the Athabaskan and the Inupiaq, uh, Richard Nelson said, I realized that if I didn't get outside and start living, that I wouldn't, that, if I, that I was spending too much time writing and thinking. I needed to get back to living life. And he did. Richard Nelson's work with the program Encounters, where he recorded animals making sounds in their natural settings in our neighboring community of Sitka, brought everyone great joy and regularly reminded me that this is a more than human world. If we can live even close to as fully as Richard Nelson, who was always smiling, I think we'll be okay. So this is for Ernestine, this is for Richard, but it's also for you and it's for me. I have some grievances with the status quo. The opinions I share here are mine, not the University of Alaska Southeast. I've tried to make this as apolitical and as critically accurate as possible. But I think my biases will be obvious by the conclusion of the talk. So just to be clear, I am for taxes. I'm for equal opportunity. I am for the environment and I am against anything that pejoratively labels or hurts any person. Uh, in short, I am for saving our broken world. And my friend Ben Dobravoni, who I worked with at the Alaska Fire Service, took this photo uh, Ben's an Alaska smoke jumper. We're on our way to St. James Bay. So many fates have aligned in my favor. I'm heteronormatively male, Caucasian, and comfortably middle class. Although mine is not a Horatio Alger rag rags to riches story, I live cheaply on a sailboat down the hill from this university so I can take my inc incremental earnings and when not employed, go climbing and skiing. Although lately I've been doing more reading and typing than climbing or skiing. I have supportive and literate parents, thankfully still living, and a broad web of family and friends who make me feel part of something larger than myself. I've been supported educationally, in part by diverse programs from Alaska's history of oil wealth, but also because of those same parents who took their children's interests seriously and made time spent reading as attractive as time spent watching TV. My parents encouraged me to spend time outside. They gave me skis, a mountain bike, the independence to make my own decisions. We spent time together as a family, floating on Alaska's rivers in the summer, skiing under the aurora in winter, hunting, fishing, sharing meals, watching public television, playing board games, traveling to visit extended family, 
Those formative years with my immediate family were very influential and both prepared me and set the stage for what I've done with my life since. You're probably thinking this guy's got it made. Cool job, cool haircut, <laughs> sailboat. How could he be unhappy? It's my, my mom, Marjorie, my dad, Joe, my brother, Tristan. Well, I'm not exactly unhappy, but even with so much support, with so many stars aligned in my orbit, one of the hardest things in life right now for me, but probably for you too, is that most of us feel like we don't have any real control of the factors influence, influencing climate. And although this isn't a talk about class identity, part of the alienation I feel about a climate changed is an underlying sense that people and institutions with more money and power than me don't care about the consequences of their wealth making. A feeling that nothing I do with my meager buying power or right to vote offers a solution. That when I take to the streets in activism, the actually powerful, the sovereign wealth fund, for example, smiles tolerantly and then continues geopolitically scheming for access to our polar natural resources, increasingly available because of a now rapidly warming Arctic. That when our president pulls the US out of the Paris Accord, the fiscally conservative, a group whose ethic of living within our means I relate with, the fiscally conservative in this country celebrate. It's one more Keynesian deregulation moment that seemingly boosts economic growth. The students in this photo are for environmental regulations. They're participating in an ODS capstone Denali National Park in May of this year. Uh, this image is of the Cat's Ear Spire on the Ramparts Glacier uh, near Denali. Not to be alarmist, but Alaska is a contested geography. We get to decide what happens here, and our voice matters. Now to the, the juicy ones. <laughs> Despair is a Latin word, desperare, that psychologists use when describing feelings of hopelessness. Despair accompanies depression, a clinical condition. I remember sitting immobilized in Providence uh, in between some 13 surgeries a little less than four years ago, thinking to myself, what if I don't recover? I actually knew right away that I was okay. I remember telling my mom that anyway. The doctor, on the other hand, although there were many, but the primary person did a great job at fixing me, but also told my mom when I moved from the ER to the ICU that I might not walk again. That's despair, feelings of hopelessness. But I did recover, and I am recovering, and I continue to this day to heal. If my fragile human body, my embodied human experience bound up in this mound of flesh can recover from a bear attack, then we can continue to live on a planet that still has 2.5 billion years left. Survival, more than anything, has reminded me that so much of what I value about my life on earth is worth saving. Yes, we need to change our behaviors, how we consume fuel, how much we travel, how we industrialize food, but that's also doable. We're an adaptive species. If I can survive, we can survive and perhaps even thrive. So the right image is of my right leg the tibia is the main weight-bearing bone, and the fibula is the smaller bone that adds the, the definition, like think really nice calves. <laughs> and because it's not weight-bearing, they didn't put a pin in that bone, uh, and I've always maintained that eventually that floating bone fragment is going to be a super fibula. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's happened yet. And then this is my pelvis, and you can see this, when I was uh, engaged with the bear, she mostly had me on my left side, 
and crushed the top of my pelvis. And so you can see that I'm, I'm missing a significant portion of my uh, iliacus, the, um, the part on the harness we, we put above our hips. And I love bears. I still love bears. All animals. There was a dog just walking around. So trauma is a funny thing. Maybe we're all broken, making the world universally post-traumatic. On the same token, if this is a post-traumatic world, what an opportunity for a candid appraisal of, of understandings that promote healing. If we the people are we the traumatized, then one plausible first step towards psychological well-being is believing, as I do, that words matter. When we choose negative language, that choice adds unnecessary stress to social situations, especially if we agree that ours is a post-traumatic world. Emotions matter. When we lose control of our emotions and yell at each other, at our children, that anger scars. Tone matters. Yes, we should empower people to express themselves, but with the understanding that doing so does not come at the cost of someone else's well-being. Positivity is mattering here. Aaron Wallace and Hope Courtney in our rock climbing class at the Sea Cliffs this September. Some of our original ideas about freedom come from the early democracy of Athenian Greece. As Plato recalls in the Apology, where Socrates is on trial for a claim that he is not worshiping state-sanctioned gods and likewise corrupting the youth of Athens, Socrates responds that he will willingly die rather than have his freedom of speech limited. Since nearly 500 BCE, freedom of speech has been a central pillar of notions about an actualized, empowered human experience. But when we evaluate our decisions in relation to the language we use, the emotions we share, take, for example, how many people talk down to each other on social media, it becomes clear that this is a culture of entitlement. We are not entitled any more than the rest of the some 7 billion people on the planet, 10 billion by the middle of this century, any more than the more than human inhabitants who are now going extinct at an alarming rate because of our short-sighted greed and inability to collaborate. That Athenian democracy, much like these United States, was built on a concept of citizenship fueled by the unvoiced toil and trauma of slaves. When people say hateful things about other people, about their belief systems, about their gender, about their race or culture, they are not more free, but rather tied to declensionist animal kingdom behaviors of dominance that spring from deep, emotively motivated identity insecurities. Hateful re language relates to past trauma, and maybe this understanding can help us move together past it. Uh, these are my friends. This is Bjorn Dila and Ben Robinson. And we made a film in August of this year. This is an unnamed mountain near Freshwater Bay on Chichikov Island that is meant to raise awareness about the impacts of logging, especially uh, on these, these fringe ecosystem creatures like black-tail deer. And I just got off a fishing boat. I've only seen the, the rough cut of the video, but I will say that I'm bent over, I'm walking pretty hard with a limp, so it's not the movie that I'll send to, Bat to, to Patagonia for full sponsorship, but, but I do think that when it comes out, it's, it's going to help us communicate constructively that revoking the Roadless Act on the Tongass is a miss uh, for Southeast Alaska. Last year at this symposium, I gave a talk on the identity crisis of mountaineering. My talk was a little bit about nature sport, but more about gender and the roles and limitations of masculinity, especially as they relate to competition and risk taking. 
A few weeks later, I gave the same talk in one of our UAS social science upper division classes. As a precursor to my presentation, I asked the class of mostly women what they were afraid of, showing first that I was scared of my own masculinity and its occasional toxicity. Answers varied, but included objectification, not being taken seriously, being physically or emotionally abused. After the class, the instructor approached me in the hallway and shared that she was scared, not of our changed climate, not of social injustice, but of men. She was scared of men. And for good reason, according to a recent UAA Justice Center report, 59% of adult women in Alaska have experienced intimate partner violence, sexual violence, or both in their lifetime. Well, nearly 12% have experienced intimate partner violence or sexual violence or both in the last year. This is Valentina Malika and Andrew Lacey uh, citing on the north sides of McGinnis and Stroller White in Spalding Meadows. Despair. Earlier this year, nearly 900 people in remote Ratadero, Toluca, population 30,000, a city in Larkarna region of Pakistan, screened positive for HIV, of which 719 were children under the age of 15. Why? Because the region is so poor that the pediatrician administering injections was recycling needles. This is the fourth HIV outbreak in Lacarna in 15 years. How is it possible with pasteurization discovered in the mid 1800s that children, even in a remote Himalayan village, are now in 2019 living lives drastically shortened by HIV because of dirty needles? If I could summarize my feelings about humanity to this black-tailed deer, my despair would speak for me and say, run away. We don't have living well very figured out. Despair is being surrounded by fellow Americans whose health care under the Affordable Care Act is really protection against a worst case scenario. Yes, what we have now is better than nothing, but more practically, the ACA is also just another monthly bill, a monthly stress and additional financial trauma an irony of so-called triumphant progressivism. Why are we trying to make ends meet in this, the richest country in the world? How can it be that the incredible material wealth produced by humanity in the 20th century, that the income gap in the United States, Krugman's great divergence, is according to economists at Harvard and Oxford, close to as wide as it was before the Great Depression. In normal speak, the rich, especially the few thousand really rich, are getting richer. Most of the US is staunchly middle class and with our modest incomes, we'll stay there. Well, millions of poor Americans are getting poorer with no options for upward mobility. The myth of financial freedom, of Horatio Alger's ragged dick making a million bucks and then finding happiness through his newfound wealth and identity as an American citizen, is just a myth for all the scantest few of the 327 million people claiming citizenship in the US. Thankfully, social science, specifically the 300, uh, specifically the 80 year Harvard study on happiness, teases out that money doesn't make us happy, but rather human connection, positivity, inclusion in groups, social purpose, these things make us happy. And this photo is from Sunday. It's a rhyme event on the summit of McGinnis with a very large group of outdoor leadership students. And they seem happy. Social science and the environmental humanities have taught me that our identity creation, our world making are two parts. One part nature, our genetics, and one part nurture, the parenting receive 
the worldly experiences we engage and encounter. I am the post-traumatic, but maybe you are too. Psychiatry teaches us to unpack the discomfort, to stretch the rubber band. As part of my privilege, my experience in this life, on this planet, I am fortunate to be born in the now endangered season, winter. Despair is the sinking recognition that we live in a changed climate. That in the coming years, and we're seeing this already with decreasing snowfall in the Juneau ice field, with the record-breaking heat of the last five years at Ikiavik, activities that we love to do, that I love to do, like skiing, will be less possible, less local, more available to the wealthy, but less likely to occur after school or on recess. This image is from the base of the south side of the Mendenhall Towers, looking out at the backside of, of the shoulder of Mount Rather, the backside of Stroller. And it's hard to see, but with all of the, there's an obvious line between snow and glacier, an obvious fern line, lots of gray snow, which has not been seen probably in 10,000 years. And then lots of white or tan rock, which really hasn't been exposed since the Pleistocene. And this was taken this summer. The importance of snow, of cold in winter, is culturally significant, and especially so for those of us who inhabit high latitudes. I see evidence of this in Aesop's fables, in indigenous travel technologies like skis and snowshoes, in the transcendentalist writing of our original American nature worshiper, Ralph Waldo Emerson. It's disorienting to think about a winter without snow. Or similarly, on a coral atoll, or in Florida, or Louisiana, or just this fall to begin relocating from New Talk. Disorientation from climate, especially with lived experience that relates to seasons, is impactful on our psychology. When I think about a life without snow, I often feel unmoored, like a ship without a course. My original coping strategy from like age six was to spend time outside, often in winter, often on skis. So if you're weirded out by less snow, I am right there with you. Climate despair is a real thing. The American Psychological Association recognizes it and increasingly attributes depression and other mental health conditions to climate despair. And I just have to point out these wonderful people. This is Kristen and Ned Rizel and Andy Stearns. And we were doing a little bit of skiing in the White Mountains Recreation Area, which is northeast of Fairbanks in the Tanna Uplands. And that's, and that's how you feel after skiing for 30 hours, that sort of effect with the... Rather than feel helpless, I feel empowered. I feel engaged. I took heart in Catherine Hayo's talk last month on combating climate silence. If an evangelical Christian who is also an atmospheric scientist can buy carbon credits and bring her message to Juno, then certainly I can stand up here too. Who says science and religion are incompatible? Science is a tool for understanding the natural world and belief systems are tools for placing ourselves in a world. Both offer epistemological understanding. And the two need not be irreconcilable. Dr. Hayhoe recommended that we talk about climate in ways that are relevant, current, constructive, and hopeful. Here's an inconvenient truth, something geopolitically current, although perhaps not that hopeful. Per an analysis by Swiss and Finnish climate policy experts published this year, China will meet its carbon reductions per the Paris Accord and probably before 2030. Likewise, China is phasing out coal from its energy production program and capped its coal emissions as far back as 2014. How is it that a, that a totalitarian regime can more effectively manage carbon emissions than these United States? And this image is from one of our ice climbing venues uh, on the Klondike Highway, about 900 feet above the sea, just north of Skagway, we call it the Curtain. So 
So what are the solutions? Oh, I can't quite see this. The image here is mostly of bear tracks. And the tracks on the right are mine. But there's got to be like four or five bears that have just walked here. So what are the solutions? I've already shared a few, but to reiterate, how we communicate matters. Speaking with negativity triggers our post-traumatic fight or flight acute stress response. Yes, the adrenal gland is helpful if you find yourself wrestling with a brown bear. <laughs> but as far as making sense out of words, it seems pretty distracting. Rather than be destructive, we need to be constructive. We get to choose how we use our language. Positivity and optimism need not be treated as naivete. Yes, we live in a changed climate, and yes, we may no longer be able to ski. But we can demand that our late capitalist society change its policies, and we have that power. We do get to vote. 2,500 years ago, Socrates was willing to die for that right to vote. We do get activism, but we must be savvy. Bears are savvy. They know where to go. They know there are salmon in the river. The riverbank is a corridor, a path of least resistance. Of course, bears are disoriented too, and things get interesting when there are less salmon, or in my case, less snow. But we need to be savvy. We need to be like the bears. We need to prioritize alternative futures for Alaska, living wage jobs that don't come at the cost of environmental degradation. In the short history of climate conversations in our country, and here I return to my story, in 2000, the first presidential election I was old enough to vote in, I, like many Alaskans and Americans, voted for third party candidate Ralph Nader. Nader, the only presidential candidate to come to Alaska in that election, and let's be honest, in most presidential elections, had spoken in the dog mushroom hall in Fairbanks earlier that year and said very succinctly that corporations were meant to work for us, not the other way around. Power to the people, I said. Ralphie, let's do it. To my dismay, or at least a common spin on that 2000 election, a vote for Nader turned out to be just enough of a distraction from Gore for W to win the presidency. W, who after eight years leading the United States through a manufactured war on terror, then mismanaging Hurricane Katrina, our first real climate disaster, then subsidizing American corporations during the recession, while hardworking Americans watched their retirements implode, earned the dubious distinction of being the most and least popular president in American history. We elect these people. They're supposed to work for us for the common good for the good of the country. But my question, in the, Socr in the Socratic style, but also as a literary device, is where did the King Salmon go? When our executives talk about developing mines, when they deregulate environmental protections, what they don't talk about are the potential downstream effects. I'll say it again, where did the King Salmon go? Yes, we need mines, but we also need to exercise restraint. W is remembered kindly by historians as effectively ineffective. If we're to believe the narrative of the recent critically acclaimed feature film Vice, George was more or less a puppet, controlled almost completely by powerful and privileged neoconservative agendas for economic deregulation and de facto against social equity. And we put him there. We gave W that power and without meaning to gave away ours. Almost two years ago, we had an opportunity to elect a woman to our highest office. Regardless of politics, electing a woman as the president of the United States would have been the most significant indicator of advancement in, of, in social equity in US history. But we didn't do it. We didn't elect her. One of the elegant pieces of the architecture of our democracy is that we soon go again to the voting booth. I like the analogy of the river flowing downhill, unstoppable, immutable. We're merely travelers on a river. The boat we're on has a captain. 
but he's the wrong one. He's got us going the wrong direction. We need to go with the current. Right now we're fighting it. Collaboration, not competition, is a beginning for evolved human behavior. Some of the socioeconomic realities of our current political climate here in Alaska are salient to a psychology of hope. If we value higher education or social services of any kind, we need to strongly advocate our elected officials, Andy Story, Representative Story is here in the audience today, for a broad-based tax. We can no longer at any level elect climate change deniers, nor can we continue to privilege corporations. If you feel helpless right now in this, our last frontier, the time has come to speak up. The only way to combat despair is with positivity. Actionable change equals resolving Alaska's political crisis. We get to do that. We have that right. It is a big deal. We have a freedom of speech. We have a right to vote. We have an obligation to vote. Our votes matter now more than ever before. Your votes matter to these ODS students on Mount Roberts. They matter if you want to continue to participate in symposiums like this. So that's Saul Martinez and Hope and Keegan and Derek and Brenna and Aaron and others. My message here is simple. Ours is a post-traumatic world. The climate is changed. Optimism and pragmatic decision-making are the only way forward. Exercise and time spent outside are healthful and calming. Hate is not. We need to stop competing and, stop co and start collaborating. A psychology of hope accepts that our actions and mindsets have consequences. Positivity may not save our world, but if the human experience is about connection, then the esprit de corps that has served humanity well so many times may yet make this proposed Anthropocene an epoch of human nature evolution, of virtue in the face of adversity, of hope, of purposeful existence. This is the critical moment in human history, and it's ours to lose. Let's swallow our adult pride, our patriarchal masculinity, our power, and take some advice from Greta Thunberg. We have that privilege. We have the education and the resources, and we are, <laughs> we are stronger together. And if in this process, this transition off of fossil fuels and away from unsustainable resource extraction, people on our planet can live without fear, can have universal access to health care and clean needles, can make a living wage and expect equal treatment, then I can let the skiing go. I'll go walking. Thank you. All right, good news chief for us. Let's give it one more round of applause. Does anyone have any questions or comments? It's meant, it's meant to be a discussion. If you could hold up until you have the mic, that would be great. Thank you for the presentation. Two months ago um, in Hawaii, it has never been experienced. And we're kind of awed struck by the changes in the climate in our Hawaiian Islands. It was the first recorded temperature of 93, 95, 98 degrees. Never in our lifetime have we ever witnessed the heat exchange in our islands. And I spoke to a friend of ours 
that's from Costa Rica, and they have the same story. And their climate has reached 105 degrees in their islands. Never, ever has this ever happened. Anyone want to respond to that? Yeah. Uh, we're seeing massive die off in the Bering Sea and the least amount of sea ice ever year after year in the last five years. There's just no question observationally that things are changing and, and warming up. Coastal erosions off the charts in Western Alaska Some of the declensionist narrative of this conversation is quite impactful. Life on the planet no longer supports humanity. The air quality is a factor. But I remain optimistic. And I think in conversations about emotion, how we handle emotions are really important in our day to day, but also in how we think about our future, how we might think about raising a family or having children, really what we're doing at all. Thank you. Part of the way I just uh, fight despair is through action. And just to let people know, I'll be outside of the door uh, with the fair share initiative to get an extra billion dollars for the state from the legacy oil fields. So if anybody wants to find me outside, I'll be there. Thanks for that. I wanted to um, thank you, Forrest, for your presentation. Um, I wanted to respond to where did the king salmon go? I lived on the Kuskokwim for a number of years, and I fished subsistence fishing. And, and uh, this year, uh, a huge die-off of king salmon on the Kuskokwim occurred. They were having heart attacks. Mm. And the reason they were having heart attacks is because of what the moment he was mentioning is the high temperatures or warming the water up to 70 degrees or, or higher in some places. And uh, they couldn't get oxygen. Warm water uh, robs the water of oxygen, the river of oxygen, and the fish uh, suffocate. And they were trying to breathe so hard they had heart attacks. That's part of what's happening to King Salmon. Hi, I also wanted to say thank you um, for your presentation and also thank you for reminding us uh, about our ability to, um, and the importance of, of being positive in these discussions. I uh, just want to briefly share an experience I had not long ago. I was invited to um, fly down to Mayo Clinic because I too had a back surgery not long ago. So I was invited to fly down to Mayo Clinic down to Rochester in Minneapolis with a man, a billionaire, uh, who owned his own plane and was piloting his own plane. And he lives in Anchorage and, and knew that uh, we had had our surgery the same week. And so he invited me. In the course of spending uh, some time with him, um, it was the week following the Climate Action Week in New York City. And my daughter happened to be there and was very engaged. So I was sharing with him some of the activities that had been taking place there. And I could tell by his reaction that he may not have been completely a climate denier, but he was not particularly pleased with the kind of um, the level of discussion that was taking place. And so he felt obligated to reassure me as a mother that things would be OK, and that in his view, uh, because humans are adaptable and we uh, have technology that we're going to figure it out. Or I found myself um, feeling like I was a captive audience because he was doing me this great favor in flying me down there. And I couldn't really challenge him the way I wanted to on his assumptions like, well, we know technology is there, but will it be used in time? And we know that we're adaptable, but we also know that the real hardship's gonna fall on those people 
that are least prepared to be able to um, survive. So I have spent a lot of time since that conversation thinking about the things I could have said and, and, and doing so in a way that would be positive and engaging. So I want to encourage each of you guys to go through that exercise in your head uh, in preparation for that future conversation that will take place and will occur because it's that level of engagement over the Thanksgiving dinner table with your uncles or somebody like that uh, that are important for purposes of moving this kind of discussion forward. Thanks. Thank you. And, and uh, Catherine Hayhoe recommended that we, we, we find some center line, some base for values and initiate that conversation with a sense of, of collaboration. So rather than being right, it's more about finding common ground. And when we start talking about families and kids and potential futures, then threats to those potential futures often seem to equal a common ground. This is a thank you for the comments, a really challenging issue for me, uh, especially with what seems to be the, the kind of adult middle-aged population we still make a, make a really big voting block, but are pretty resistant to the idea that things are changing, consequences are real. And it's scary. We're vulnerable more now than ever. But we do get to vote. That's huge. We do get to talk to people. Hi. Um, in such a divided political climate, how do you maintain your hope? Because things here at UA are falling apart um, statewide, other than the school system and the whole country. So how are you staying so optimistic? I'm cautiously optimistic. <laughs> Partly because you know, part of my thesis here is that I'm traumatized and we're all traumatized. And if I'm negative, it doesn't help. But I'm taking it day by day and trying to make actionable change when I can. For example, last week, the teaching union flew me to Fairbanks and I testified to the Board of Regents about what we're doing here at the University of Alaska, the importance of what the Outdoor Studies program does for people, for communities. And I felt, felt really positive about their response. I felt like the board heard what I had to say, that they have the, the fiduciary responsibility for this university in mind, and that they represent a very diverse demographic of Alaskans, which is just and right. There's 11 people in that body. They're volunteers. They're making decisions about our future, about the future of students, about the future of faculty, about the future of these separate accredited universities. But I was heartened by that experience, by engaging the decision making that relates to this politically divided time. probably have to move on. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, guys. Um, our first break breakout session is going to start at 10.15. So everything's being pushed back 15 minutes. But the second keynote will start at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.